Well, good morning, West Portal. Uh, it's great to be with you. What a great celebration we've had so far. And we want to continue on with that series that we're in, the series of good questions. Like Caitlin shared and like Sean shared, sometimes uh, when we step out of this place, we encounter questions in life. And we want to be the kind of disciples who are willing to meet these questions head on. And today, we got a doozy for us. Uh, it's the question of the relationship between science and faith. Or to put it uh, more pointedly, has science disproved faith? Now you hear all about the conflict between science and faith in lecture halls, where they put forward the theory of the, the god of the gaps, that basically <clears throat> humanity has invented a god or gods to fill in those areas where we don't know. The, the space between what we do know and what we don't know is uh, filled with God. So um, it was Baal who stormed on the sky, creating thunder and lightning, or Thor, or Gitche Manitou, until we discovered that there's ice particles in the clouds that bump into one another, creating a static charge. And as this static charge grows and grows, it reaches down through the cloud and touches the earth, and zap, we have lightning. Or it was, um, it was the goddess, the Greek goddess, goddesses, Hore, uh, from which we get the word hours, who, who determined the seasons until we learned about the rotation of the earth and the revolution of the earth around the sun. Or it was the Babylonian god, Marduk, who created a humanity out of the blood and bones of the evil god, a king U. Or Yahweh, who created a man out of the dust and a woman out of his side, until we understood biology and genetics and the origin of the species. And so the theory goes that as our knowledge increases, uh, the gaps decrease and our need for God decreases until one day there is no gap and no need for God. We run into this as well in, in books, books by Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris that say that science in particular, and uh, science in general, and evolutionary science in particular has um, removed has taken the belief of God and made it unnecessary or obsolete. Richard Dawkins goes so far to make the argument that you cannot be intelligent and scientific and hold religious beliefs at the same time. That you have to be one or the other. And his, his argument comes from a study that was done in 1998 of, um, of scientists that said 7% of American of Americans who are part of the National, uh, National Science Academy believe in a personal God. And so from that, he, he concludes that the more intelligent, the more rational, the more scientifically minded you are, the less likely you are to believe in God. And we run into this in the everyday marketplaces where someone says that, is it, it's irrational to believe in God. You, you don't believe in a flat earth or in Bigfoot or in Area 51. So why? Why would you believe in this? Faith is irrational. Now, I am glad to be here uh, and to speak on this because I'm thankful for science. I'm thankful for the discoveries that they've made, what we've made, and what they've led to. I'm thankful uh, for pacemakers. I'm thankful for for FaceTime. I'm thankful for Boeing 747s. Uh, I'm I'm also someone who loves creation. I love the sunrises on this big blue sky. I love these lightning storms that we get here in the prairies. I don't love the hail so much, but I, I, I also love the creator, the one who has created all things, including our mind. So I want to guide us this morning as we worship God. Jesus commanded us, worship the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your 
mind and with all your strength. And so we want to, we want to worship God with our mind as we think about this relationship between science and uh, faith. And this is for you if you're a Christian or you if you're a, a skeptic here this morning. Uh, we want to talk well together. And I have three points this morning. The first is that Christians need to practice humility. Christians need to practice humility. See, there's a, a, a small group of vocal Christians who think that science is the enemy, that science is responsible for the decline in morality, that science dupes us, it'll destroy us, that science is the devil. Well, I, I understand where that's coming from, but science itself is not moral or it's not immoral, it is amoral. Science doesn't give morality. Science is a method of, of studying, of observing, and of testing, a way to, to grow in knowledge. How we handle science is another issue. Uh, I like the way that Gord Penner from Steinbach Bible College put it. He said that science, good science, tells us the when and the how, not the who and the why. So Christians need to practice humility. You see, back in the 16th century, a guy by the name of Nicholas, uh, Nicholas uh, Copernicus, he observed the planets, and he, he proposed a, a model for the, uh, for the universe in which the sun became the center of the universe and not the earth, that the, uh, the, the earth goes around the sun and not vice versa. Well, two famous theologians, Martin Luther and John Calvin, felt that this was an attack on their scriptures. And they said, no, 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 Nicholas. The, uh, the, the earth, the sun goes around the earth and not the other way around. And Luther is quoted as saying that Joshua commanded the sun and not the earth to stand still. From Joshua 10, verse 12 and 13, on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Idola. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a, a full day. From this passage, Martin Luther extrapolated a geocentric worldview, that the earth was the center of all things. Now, I don't know of anyone who still holds to a geocentric worldview, that the sun revolves around the earth and not vice versa. And if a, a, a bright guy, a, a great exegete, a devout Christian like Martin Luther can get it wrong, so can I. See, Christians, we have to be discerning on how we read and apply biblical passages. The, the passage in Joshua was never intended to tell us of astronomy, of how the universe goes, but of the Lord's sovereignty over the universe. Phrases were used then like we use them now. We talk about the sunrise and the sunset. But never, never by saying that do we intend that the sun is rising. It just appears that way from our point of view. We need to practice humility in our scriptures. Concerning Genesis, listen to Andrew Hill. He said, Genesis is the book of beginnings. It is not a book of science, though scientists have a right to investigate its claims. It's not a book of biographies, though much can be learned from the lives of men and women portrayed in its pages. It's not a book of history, though history is the path it follows. It is a book of theology. So when we come to the books of the Bible, we need to be aware of what they are saying and of how they are saying and not read into them our thoughts and our world views. We'll unpack that a little bit more in the discussion hour afterwards. But for now, Christians need to practice humility. And scientists need to practice humility too. Scientists have not always gotten it right. 
fact, the way that we go about in the scientific method is that we, we develop a hypothesis and then we hold it tentatively. We continue to observe and to test and to see if there is more evidence or we come to a fuller understanding. And so this Copernicus system, which stated that the sun was the center of the universe, was itself replaced when Johannes Kepler said that, no, 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 the universe is much grander than that, as he saw stars and other galaxies. See, scientists need to practice humility with their theories. And scientists need to practice humility with their domains. As I said before, science, good science, can help with the how and the when not with the who and the why. The function of setting up goals and passing statements of value transcends the domain of science. See, when science tries to tell us why there is a universe or or, um, a system of ethics from observable facts, it moves from the domain of science into the domain of philosophy. And that is uh, the wrong place. Uh, That is beyond the scope of good science. And that's where Richard Dawkins goes in his book, The God Delusion. He does not practice humility. So David Berlinski, an agnostic and skeptic himself, he, he takes Darwin and his ilk to task. Listen, has anyone provided proof of God's inexistence? Not even close. Has quantum cosmology explained the emergence of the universe or why it's here? Not even close. Have our sciences explained why our universe seems to be fine-tuned to allow for the existence of life? Not even close. Are physicists and biologists willing to believe in anything so long as it's not religious thought? Close enough. Has rationalism and moral thought provided us with an understanding of what is good, what is right, and what is moral? Not close enough. Has secularism in the terrible 20th century been a force for good? Not even close to being close. Is there a narrow and oppressive orthodoxy in the sciences? Close enough. Does anything in the sciences or their their philosophy justify the claim that religious belief is irrational? Not even in the ballpark. Is scientific atheism a frivolous exercise in intellectual contempt? Dead on. Ah, it's a, uh, it is a mouthful, but Berlinski takes these, these folks to task to say, no, 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 science does not lead to atheism, and to promote a philosophy through the use of science is not right. You scientists are not being scientific enough. Christians and scientists need to practice humility. Amen? One more time, just so you're with me here, church. Well, scientists and and, uh, Christians need to practice humility. Amen? Amen. All right, all right. Now, the second point, the second point is that everybody has faith. Everyone has faith. Belief in God requires faith. That's to say that I cannot scientifically prove to you that God exists. Uh, There's no airtight proof that will convince you. You see, I can take a jar of air, and I can can look at it under a a microscope, uh, something more powerful, and I can see that there is is nitrogen and oxygen, that there's uh, traces of argon and carbon dioxide and water moisture, but I can't see God. There is no God molecule in here. See, I cannot prove to you in an airtight manner that God exists. That's simply impossible. But I don't think that it's necessary. See, if you believe that you need an airtight proof in order to believe that something exists, that's called strong rationalism. And there is no airtight proof for strong rationalism. I cannot grab some of the air here and look at it and say, oh yeah, argon, nitrogen, and strong rationalism. There it is. No, it's an idea. It's a world view. And we all have world views. That's why I say that everyone has faith. 
Everyone has faith. Now, the dominant worldview in the scientific community is the natural worldview, which assumes that there's only a natural cause, only a natural cause for everything. Everything is contingent upon natural causes. So when the naturalist comes to something that is miraculous, such as uh, what happened with my uncle Hank. He took a biopsy and saw that he had cancer in his abdomen. They cut him open to, uh, to, to operate upon it, and they found that there was nothing there. He knew why, but the, 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 the person observing him, they were searching for a natural reason. Why? Because she, she has she believes in materialism. She believes in the laws of nature. She believes that there is only natural causes. She has faith. The scientist and the Christian are in the same boat. They both have faith. Everyone has faith. And I cannot, I cannot prove to you that God exists but I also cannot prove to you that God doesn't exist. There is no experiment, no tool, no measurement that can say that God doesn't exist. Atheism is a faith position. But James, you might say, you also can't prove that unicorns or UFOs don't exist, right? Well, that's a good question. So let's look and see if belief in God is rational. Is faith in God rational? And I believe that it is. In fact, I believe that it's the more rational worldview. When we take the fields of biology and of physics and of history and of ethics and we pull these all together, I think that Christianity comes up with the fullest and most satisfying explanation of all of these, which is my third point. Where did my, uh, there's my glass. My third point is follow the clues. Science gives clues for God. See, I, w I want us to be good scientists, to look at the evidence and then to, uh, to, to hypothesize as to why that is. Rather than Christianity being in conflict with science, I believe that they are good friends. And that's why modern science arose out of the soil of Christianity in the Western world. And if you're open to where the evidence leads, I think you'll see that science gives good clues to for God. Philosopher Alvin Plantinga, he says that there's two to three dozen very good arguments for belief in God. I'm not going to go through all of them here. I just want to examine with you two arguments. Two arguments. The first is called the contingency argument. Nothing comes from nothing. Okay? The argument has gained prominence in the wake of the Big Bang Theory that, that there is evidence that the universe is expanding. And so the hypothesis is given that it, it originated at a single point. At a single point in time, there was an amazing outburst of energy that has created this universe. But how did that single point happen? Nothing comes from nothing. Everything we know in this world is contingent. It has a cause outside of itself. Therefore, the universe, which is just a massive pile of contingent entities, would have to be dependent upon some cause outside of itself. Something had to make the Big Bang happen. But what? What could it be but something outside of nature that is supernatural, that is non-contingent, being a being that exists from itself? Nothing comes from nothing. Scientists cannot make something from nothing. A, a group of scientists one time uh, challenged God, and they said, God, uh, we, we, can, we can clone humans, we can transplant organs, we can even create life. We don't need you anymore. 
Is that so? God says, well, why don't we test your, your theory here and have a little competition? Why don't we create a human life? All right, said the scientist. Okay, said God, let's do it uh, like I did in the old days, uh, like I created Adam. All right, said the scientist. He reached down to grab some dirt. God said, whoa, 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 hold on there. You make your own dirt. <laughs> See, you need something, anything, to make nothing comes from nothing. That you always need something to begin with. And this, I think, science cannot show how it begins, but Christianity can. That's the contingency argument. The second is the fine-tuning argument. Now, for organic life to exist, there are 15, 15 independent constants of physics. The speed of light, the gravitational constant, the strength of weak and strong nuclear forces. They must have all values that fall in an extremely narrow range. And the probability of perfect calibration happening by chance is so tiny as to be statistically negligible. But don't take my word for it, Stephen Hawking's. He concludes that the odds against a universe like ours emerging out of something like the Big Bang are enormous. I think there are clearly religious implications. And elsewhere, he says, it would be very difficult to explain why the universe would have begun in just this way, except as the act of a God who intended to create beings like us. Tim Keller he says that it's like the universe rolled out the welcome mat for humanity. I think this is a great argument. A philosopher, John Leslie, he says, and now just imagine that there is a man who is condemned to be executed by, a, a, by, a, um, by marksmen, 50 expert marksmen from six feet away. And these... 50 expert marksmen all shoot at the same time, but not one bullet hits the man. Now, it's possible. It's possible for an expert marksman to miss at close range. And it's technically possible for, for 50 expert marksmen to all miss at the same time. Though you could not prove they had a conspiracy to miss, it would be unreasonable to draw the conclusion that they hadn't. See, though you cannot prove that the fine-tuning of this universe is due to some design, it is unreasonable to draw the conclusion that it wasn't. Although organic life could have happened without a creator, does it make sense? to live as if this infinitely remote chance were true. What if science actually points humanity toward God instead of disproving God? That's what Paul writes in the book of Romans. He says, For the, since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. See, in other words, what the Bible teaches is that science is not the enemy of faith, but simply one of the means by which we look into the world and we learn about God. God constantly woos us through the world he has made, through the red giants and the prairie sky poplars, all the way to the one-celled protozoans. He constantly preaches at us saying, I am here and I love you. See, Paul says that the problem isn't a lack of evidence, but our suppression of it. Continue on with that quote, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
See, the problem is not the, that the evidence, uh, the problem is not a lack of evidence. It's that we overlook the signposts because we'd rather believe something else. And if that describes you, I hope that you will consider that God is trying to get your attention. And tomorrow, when the sun rises, it's not just because of the rotation of the planet, but because God is love. And behind all the wonderful beauty that the scientific study shows us, he wants us to discover the God who created. Amen. I want to call forward the worship team and let me pray with us here. Father, Father, thank you that you have not left us without evidence that this world, that our lives display your fingerprints. And I pray that we as, as those who want to learn knowledge, as those who are open for a greater understanding as we seek these things, Lord, you would reveal yourself to us. And for those who do not know you, Lord, as they seek for you, may you make yourself known to them. Thank you for the fullness of this revelation that we could see in Jesus Christ, the one who lived for us and who died for us, so that we might live forever as your children. To his name be honor and glory now and forever. Amen.